So we can cycle and recycle most of the organic material needed for life. But what technologies are necessary for a self-sustaining lunar greenhouse? In addition to what Lane has said about the South Pole Chamber, it also allowed us to develop the water jacketed lamp we will use in the lunar greenhouse that we're constructing. It puts out enough light to run the plants, but it captures enough heat in the water to reject the heat out of the habitat. Because once you get enough light in the greenhouse, you cook it with the, the amount of energy from the, the lighting. So that's been a real advantage for, for our effort. The current lab at the University of Arizona already has some of the basic elements for the next step in place. There is a composter, it's called a thermophilic composter that maintains high temperatures and you put in compost on one side and you take out compost on the other side and you do this daily. So it's a constant input output type of system. And the idea is that such a composter is capable of composting garbage, sewage, as well as what we expect to find is waste coming out of a composter system, which uh, according to the literature and, and, our, and our initial experiments, uh, a thermophilic composter does very nicely, copious amounts of CO2 coming out of it, and balance it with a hydroponic greenhouse with all the plants. And so you're essentially balancing the CO2 coming out of a composter while it's doing the work of cleaning up your wastes. With uh, a greenhouse uh, full of plants which are refreshing the air in which you're breathing with oxygen, sequestering CO2 from the composter, and providing you with a portion of your daily meals. So balancing those two systems is the next step and both those elements exist at the lab and work is getting underway right now. We're hoping to close the cycle because once we tie the composter in with the greenhouse and both those systems are closed, then we can start working on balancing the systems. The next step is to demonstrate that technology in a harsh, isolated environment. And there are many reasons I think that the South Pole is ideal for testing these technologies. Well, there's the temperature. It's the coldest place on Earth, and temperature is going to be an issue, especially if you drop into Shackleton's crater. Your equipment is going to have to be able to survive it in extremely cold temperatures. And in a laboratory, you can pull temperatures down, but to have a, an analog in an uh, environment that will support a tractor and an analog that's, you know, sizable, a, a cold chamber doesn't exist that size to bring it down to... What did you have, Lane? You had, you had quite a few days below 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, yes, negative 100. Yeah, uh, 108. the record there is 118 below. And the NSF's interested in pushing farther up on the Antarctic Plateau, where the Antarctic record is 128 below zero Fahrenheit, and there's colder temperatures in Antarctica besides that. So we're interested in, in finding the coldest places that we can operate in, because once the habitat's buried, it exists in a frozen world, 30 centimeters below the surface at minus 30 C. Yeah, a constant on the moon, a constant negative 30 degrees Celsius underneath the regolith, which is nice. I mean, we experience those temperatures in Antarctica all the time. It's when you're on top of the lunar surface, above the regolith, that you encounter temperatures that are much more dynamic and an environment that is far more hazardous in terms of radiation coming off the sun, all kinds of things. And the astronauts on the lunar surface will probably do a good portion of their work the dark portion of the lunar night because of possibility of solar flares and, and solar energized particles. So we, we may be working in more of a frozen world than an extremely warm world. Right. The moon gives us both extremely hot and extremely cold on the surface. Currently at the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center at the University of Arizona, we are supporting still the South Pole Food Growth Chamber remotely. We have access to the environmental controls two on-site cameras that we can access whenever the satellite is cooperating and available. That's about 11 hours a day that we can peer into the growth chamber. And at some level, we can control and certainly assist with the operation of that growth chamber. Now, certainly a, a large portion of the lunar mission is going to require remote control of all kinds of technologies. And that's something that we're learning right now because, you know, doesn't get much more remote than the South Pole on planet Earth, and so it makes, it makes for a fine analog.